Chocolate is fascinating, fun. Chocolate is romantic. Chocolate is a warm hug. Messy. <laughs> Messy. <laughs> well said. Chocolate is mouth-watering, satisfying, extravagant, lavish, beautiful. Super delicious. <laughs> the journey from the discovery of cacao to present day to a chocolate bar is a long, fascinating piece of history. We've had blinds blow up on us to where you're literally covered from head to toe in chocolate. Yeah. So always worse things you can be covered in, we always say. A lot of people are surprised to find out that everything on there is completely edible. We also get a lot of people are surprised to find out that everything's done by hand. Everybody said, wow, this is different. Somebody said that uh, this is life-changing you know, chocolate. It's hard to find anything that you really feel like you have, have accomplished something. And making the chocolates, I feel like I've accomplished something. People don't realize what amazing things are coming out of this part of the country and going all over the United States. When Nebraskans think of chocolate today, Baker's Candies and Greenwood often comes to mind. The plant, started by Kevin Baker in 1986 as a way to provide for his family, is now a family-run operation. There's a lot of things I want to go in other than candy, but I had a family to support, and I knew if we'd do this and do it right, that we could get it going pretty soon, and we did. Before starting Baker's Candies, Kevin built, designed, and maintained automated equipment in the aerospace industry. His start in candy came when he was hired by Lincoln Chocolate Company, House of Bauer. I was hired to come in and uh, update equipment, try to automate it, get them efficient, and make some money. And we got her going good, and so I think it started showing a profit, so basically they sold out the price candy out of Richmond, Missouri, which was later bought by a bunch of investors and they bankrupted. Not to be deterred, Kevin took his ideas he'd been developing for House of Bauer and built the first Baker's Candy Building with help from family and never looked back. I was not a candy maker, but I knew how to make candy. I mean, I, would, I didn't know the recipes, but I knew what needed to be done that we could make it efficiently. We hired a guy that knew more about chocolate, and he would work the recipes, and we would run tests and try things to see how fast we could run it, get the chocolate to set, is it compatible with our equipment. Today, Kevin's sons, Todd and Paul, have integral roles in the company's day-to-day -day operations. There are photographs of Paul and I on our David Hasselhoff Knight Rider big wheels uh, rolling around the, uh, the Bauer and Blum plant in Lincoln. And so uh, the chocolate industry is really all we've ever known. We're pretty good at making chocolate, having spent our whole lives doing this. The bakers estimate they produced between three and 400,000 pounds of chocolate in 2017. That results in at least 30 million meltaways. By my math, that amounts to about 12, 15 meltaways per Nebraskan. According to Paul, milk chocolate red is the fan favorite, followed closely by dark chocolate mint. But which one do the bakers like best? They all taste like work, is our famous saying around here. Like Nebraska farmers sell corn and soybeans, the bakers buy their chocolate on the open commodity market. The cocoa beans come to the United States on a ship, uh, just like every chocolate company gets their cocoa beans. However, we have them processed into these nice, convenient melding ingots. A pallet like this of chocolate liquor uh, actually is probably about the equivalent of an entire semi-trailer full of dry, roasted cocoa beans. And so being far more dense, we're able to get uh, about 30 of these pallets uh, onto a semi-truck, and we can get a lot more cocoa here to Nebraska so that we can redistribute it. After 10-pound chocolate liquor blocks are melted, they're mixed with cocoa butter and flavorings to begin the process of creating the famous Baker's Meltaway. From the beginning to the end, the entire process takes about 90 minutes. That includes the time it took to, to literally pump it out onto the floor, form, shape, coat, cool, twist wrap, and, uh, and send it into this catch bucket like you see right here. Let's speed that 90-minute process up a bit, shall we?
Okay, now let's try it slow. Baker's chocolates are so good, people come from miles around. Some even pedal their way. An annual chocolate bike ride by the Great Plains Bicycling Club brings chocoholics 40 miles round trip to satisfy their chocolate cravings. We do the Bob Brown Memorial Easter Bunny chocolate ride. This is a memorial for Bob, who along with his wife Anne, were longtime members of the club. Bob was a real chocolate lover. So about weekly during the summer, they would ride out from their home up here to Highway 6 and up to Greenwood to Baker's Chocolates, where Bob would replenish the supplies and they would ride back. Bob passed away suddenly a few years back, and I decided we needed to continue the ride. Uh, and so I've led that ride for the last few years. To accommodate chocolate lovers from across Nebraska, Baker's is expanding. A 5,000 square foot retail store edition is slated to open in 2019 a testament to their efficiency. A chocolate factory our size in the year 1980 would have had to have employed at least 100 people to do what we're now able to do on our production floor with just three employees. Literally, machinery does 100% of the labor-intensive work out here on the candy factory floor. And so when people come to the chocolate factory looking for Oompa Loompas, they're often disappointed to find they've all been outsourced by automated production equipment. In fact, automation may have led to the demise of Lincoln's second largest employer of the 1950s and 60s. Let's take a look back at the Haymarket when cranking out hand-dipped confections was a top priority. We're at 8th and P in Haymarket in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I think of this as the, the center of chocolate in Lincoln, and maybe the center of chocolate in all of Nebraska. Because behind me is the candy factory, what originally was the Gillen and Bonnie Candy Company. Uh, they were a Lincoln firm that went all the way back to 1895, and they in fact went back to 1895 in this building, although it didn't look like this at that time. Ed Zimmer is down. Lincoln's leading historian. He takes us through what today is a revitalized urban area and what once was Lincoln's chocolate mecca. Frank Gillen and William Bonney worked for competing candy companies. Gillen for Lash Brothers, Bonney for Lincoln Confectionery Company. After about a year as competitors, they join forces. Almost immediately after Gillen and Bonnie formed their own company, their building burned down in 1895. And somehow they didn't go out of business. They, in fact, bought the two-thirds of the site that had burned out and rebuilt their three stories in 1906. Then they added a fourth story on top of that and eventually bought and remodeled the whole exterior. So that whole corner of 8th and P was the Gillen and Bonnie building. The foundation laid by Gillen and Bonnie turned into Russell Stover, Lincoln's leading chocolate company in history. Stover's first came to Lincoln not as manufacturers, but as retailers. They weren't called Russell Stover, they were called Mrs. Stover's Bungalow Candies. And they were in several locations around 13th and O, eventually operating out of the Miller and Payne Department Store building. During World War II, in order not to be put out of business by the rationing, they bought regional candy companies, and Gill and Bonnie was one of them they bought. By 1943, when Russell Stover took over operations of Gillen's Candies, they had 43 locations around the region. Not long after that, in the spring of 1946, an 18-year-old named Margaret began working there. I think I weighed 114 pounds when I started there. <laughs> Boy, it didn't take long to pick up to at least 118 or so. <laughs> and I've been heavy ever since. <laughs> if I took that first piece in the morning, I ate it all day long. But if I never ate a piece, then I was okay. <laughs> Not long after she started working there, Margaret met a teenage candy maker named Leonard. In October of 1947, when she was 19 and he was 20, they got married. Both Margaret and Leonard made a career out of Russell Stover. 
working there until 1980 when offices and major production moved to Kansas City. But before that happened, Russell Stover was a major player in Lincoln. Their payroll eventually reached 800, and they were producing a million pounds of candy a month out of the Haymarket District. I started out as a service girl for the Nut Cluster Dippers, and uh, I did that for a while, and then I learned to dip the clusters too, you know, myself. And then from there, I learned to do the, the designs, the hand dipping. And uh, I did chocolate and pastel both. As a perfectionist, Margaret had a hard time meeting the 120 to 150 tray quota during her eight hour shifts. With 82 pieces of candy on a tray, workers would have each dipped over 10,000 pieces of candy each shift. If you was going to make for vanilla cream, that was a V and you use three fingers and made the, the V. And my chocolate butter was a rough top, so you, it was kind of a rough top. It, um, and then for um, caramels, it was a cup. I still run into people around Lincoln who worked out what they almost always would call stovers, and they have fond memories of coming home smelling of chocolate. Didn't pay a lot, but I stayed because I liked to dip, and I, like the people, and so I, I just enjoyed working there. The Lales started their family while working at Stover's. The kids remember their parents coming home with chocolate for them on a regular basis. It was a, like a three pound box, and we only paid a dollar for the seconds. Today, inside the candy factory atrium, a tree grows from one of the vats that was used to melt the chocolate all those years ago. And train tracks still disappear into the building. As Russell Stover expanded in Lincoln, they went beyond the Gil and Bonnie building into about half a dozen of the buildings around them, including the big HP Law grocery warehouse north of them. From the north, a spur line came right into the HP Law building and all the way down into the old Gil and Bonnie building so they could take deliveries by rail right inside the building. Former Russell Stover employees still get together twice a year for coffee and breakfast. Yeah, we talk some about it and how things changed and some of the people that are gone that we really miss and everything, so it's just fun to get together. Today in Texas, Frank Gillen's great-grandson still makes chocolate under the Gillen candy brand. In Lincoln in 2013, with the construction of the Pinnacle Bank Arena, came a piece of art by Philadelphia artist Donald Lipsky called Box of Chocolates. It is 16 feet wide by 9 feet high and contains 144 chocolate pieces. The artwork pays homage to the area's rich chocolate history. I'm Todd Baker with Baker's Candies, and shipping chocolate, especially in Nebraska, and particularly in the summer, can be quite difficult. If you're going to ship chocolate from home, here's what you need to do. First, start with any standard corrugated box. If you can, put insulation first at the bottom, followed by the candy, our local sports page. We use eutectic gel packs like these. You can no longer ship dry ice via most commercial channels, and so eutectic gel ice is great for two to three day shipping. Place it on top of your newspaper. Then from there, we're going to add one more layer of insulation to the top of the box. And then here is the key. When we close the box, we want to tape it not simply along its vertical seam, but also along each of the horizontal seams as well. What we're hoping to do is make this package airtight. By doing this, your chocolate will last about 40% longer, and it's the key that everybody misses when they ship chocolate from home. Lincoln's Haymarket will forever be connected to the city's chocolate past. Today, it's still an area where chocolate lovers can find something satisfying. At their peak, Russell Silver was using about half a dozen buildings in Haymarket, both on the candy factory block and even across the street here, uh, what's now the mill. And this was one of the key buildings in the revitalization of the area. I uh, hear they even sell chocolate inside here now. Some of the chocolate sold inside the mill is made by Shinya Takahashi, a nutrition and health science professor by day and chocolate maker by night. His chocolate is known as Nama Choco. I don't advertise my side of business, chocolate business, to my students or anybody else on campus uh, because one hand I'm um, you know, advocating or 
preaching students that uh, you know healthy lifestyle but then I make a chocolate <laughs> to sell people once in a while I, when I go to the male coffee shop in town there are students you know uh, studying for uh, exams and I see them and oh you're the professor oh yes <laughs> and it's a little bit awkward situation sometimes Kansas State has Shinya moved from Japan to Nebraska to study exercise science after watching the Nebraska football team play Kansas State in Tokyo in 1992. What I saw on TV, uh, Nebraska playing against uh, K-State and they were really strong. Tommy Frazier was a freshman and he was a quarterback and they beat uh, K-State. So I was pretty uh, impressed by that and I decided to come to Nebraska. Shinya began making his Japanese chocolates as a way to bring a taste of home to his family and friends in Nebraska. The chocolate that I make is really popular in Japan, uh, especially the, uh, the Valentine's Day uh, time, uh, maybe a January through maybe a March. But I haven't seen anything like that in U.S. And so I started to kind of experiment and uh, you know uh, try to find a cross. Uh, chocolate that I'm used to. He turned it into a business in 2014 after winning the People's Choice Award at Lincoln's Chocolate Lovers Fantasy event. That was the first time he entered, and he's held the title every year since. When we went to the Chocolate Lovers Fantasy first time, uh, we provided samples, and everybody said, wow, this is different. Somebody said that uh, this is life-changing you know, chocolate. His recipes are simple in appearance and ingredients. Shinya prefers to let the chocolates speak for themselves. I'm not uh, uh, making a chocolate from a scratch. I'm using baking chips, basically, chocolate chips. And then I put the, some uh, ingredients and then I make that uh, texture much, much soft and smooth. And I think that's the uh, difference uh, when you compare to other chocolates. Nama Choco comes in five flavors, dark chocolate, sea salt, mint, sea salted caramel, and raspberry. My chocolate is temperature sensitive, so the, my chocolate needs to be always in the refrigerator, and it can last, you know, I'm really comfortable maybe at uh, seven to 10 days, but beyond that, I won't be able to uh, guarantee that, uh, you know, that, that chocolate is good. All right, come by. <laughs> Shinya makes Nama Chaco in his mother-in-law's basement kitchen, because that meets the proper certifications for a food processor license. Nama meaning the fresh in Japanese, and choco is the chocolate. Around the same time Shinya Takahashi was coming to Nebraska because of the football program, Kansas City native Christopher Elbow was here as part of the University of Nebraska Lincoln's swim team. He is now a premier chocolatier in his self-titled Chocolate Empire in Kansas City. Christopher Elbow Chocolates is a modern chocolate factory. We produce handmade bonbons, truffles, confections with uh, unique flavor combinations and also uh, with a design element. We do a lot of hand painting and airbrushing. So every chocolate that we produce has its own uh, um, unique identity. Christopher's road to success has been long and being a chocolatier wasn't part of his plan while attending the University of Nebraska. I was majoring in restaurant and food service administration at UNL and a lot of the uh, classes I was in were very chemistry, food science centric, which actually gave me a really great foundation of uh, um, when I did start my culinary career. Elbow started out as a chef cooking savory food. I had the opportunity to work in a pastry kitchen out in Las Vegas and that's where I discovered my love for desserts and chocolate. and. Um, kind of all things sweet. Even though chocolate making wasn't in the plans when Christopher was at the university, he says what he learned there does translate. Chocolate and pastry and baking are very scientific and um, you know having that knowledge that I learned at UNL uh, really helped me uh, gain insight on the how to correct problems and then uh, um, come up with new uh, techniques and new ideas. We visited Elbow just three weeks after moving into his new global headquarters in Kansas City. 
We started in a 400 square foot room above a restaurant. It was very small scale, it was just me. Um, didn't have any employees other than my wife and my mom would come down and help tie bows and things like that in, in the very early parts of the uh, business. But right from the beginning, we couldn't keep up with demand. The move to the new building should allow for future expansion. All of our bonbon and confection production will take place here, um, and it also houses all of our packaging operation, our shipping and warehousing, and then all of our corporate offices. We were working under the roofs of three buildings, separate buildings before, and just as we've grown, we've kind of pieced together what we could, um, but ultimately we needed more space. Confections created here are works of art that go through many steps before hitting the consumer's mouth. The bonbons is really what we kind of became famous for um, and kind of the core part of our business. That process starts out with airbrushing, kind of the same airbrushes you would use as a hobbyist. And it's uh, our paint, um, so to speak, is colored cocoa butter. So we will paint the molds with uh, airbrushes or sometimes we'll splatter them or hand paint them. Once that is set, we'll pour the chocolate into the mold and it will form the shell. You pour the excess out, the rest will drip out and kind of leave behind a, a thin shell. And after that sets up, that's what we'll fill with our filling. Fillings for the Belgian style bonbons are made with well thought out ingredients. Together, they create unique flavor combinations. We like to do a lot of kind of really soft infused caramels, so using spices, herbs, different kind of fruits and, and flavors, alcohols and things like that that uh, uh, all go really, really well with chocolate. So once we make those and fill them up, they'll set for a day and then we'll seal them up the next day and turn them out. The other style of bonbon they create is called a French style ganache. We would pour the filling in a frame we would cut it into squares the next day, and then on the third day, it would go through an enrobing machine and get a really thin coating of chocolate on it. And then we'll actually decorate those at that point, usually with what's called a transfer sheet, which is cocoa butter that's been silk screened onto a, a sheet of acetate. And we put it on the chocolate when it's wet, pull it off after it's set. It's kind of like a temporary tattoo, so we can digitally create almost any design for those types of bonbons. Elbow and his team are always looking for new flavor combinations, and those they come up with are intentional. One thing that's been kind of a key to our success is we don't do anything weird for the sake of being weird or trendy. Kind of what I tell my staff is, if we eat it and we say, huh, that's interesting, then it's probably not something that we should sell. We like to keep things simple. The worst reaction a customer could say would, would be, that's interesting. It's like the worst thing you can say to a chef. Even with room for growth in the new space, Christopher emphasizes they aren't looking to produce bigger batches of chocolate. We're dedicated to small batch production. And, you know, we, we do want to grow and we do want to make more chocolates, but we're at a certain point where our bat size is perfect for maintaining our quality. Our really primary focus is to stay innovative and keep doing new products and new flavors and, and kind of staying at the forefront of the chocolate world. If Christopher Elbow runs a chocolate empire in Kansas City, Susie Robison is Takema's queen and her shop, Master's Hand, is her castle. Nestled between Sioux City and Omaha, it started as a single mom making candles with her kids. Now it not only sells candles, but is a floral shop, boutique, luncheon, bakery, and of course, a candy shop. That part is known as Serendipity Chocolates. We are what we call every woman's dream shop, but we're also every man's dream shop when he's in the doghouse. So, yeah. We just wanted to make a sanctuary, a, a place where women could go, because unless you're intentional about life, it just passes you by. When Susie decided to add serendipity chocolates to the business, she looked to her past for inspiration. That desire kind of started with my mom and um, my Aunt Esther, and um, they always made a lot of candies and things like that at holiday times. Our chocolate covered cherries and barks and toffees and things like that, that all came from my mom and my aunt. Susie says what makes their chocolate so good is the ingredients used. We make everything with real cream, real butter, and real love and not the fake love. You know, you can get fake love anywhere, but we make it with real love, and that makes a difference. 
when people come in, we want them to leave with a sweet taste in their mouth. And so we give away a lot of just free samples. And so this little boy came up and he was sampling all kinds of chocolate. And so the first one that he sampled, it was a peanut butter peanut. And he apparently loved it a lot. And, he's, and he shouts over to his mom, Mom, you've got to try this. It's a chance of a lifetime. <laughs> Five years ago, Susie married Scott. A couple years after that, he lost his sight. Susie says it's because of all the adversity in her life that she is where she is today. The things that looked horrible in the beginning, they became part of the, the rocky road of the story that we have to tell. In the early years of Master's Hand, when we just made candles just to live, if somebody would have just come behind me and just gave me $500, Master's Hand would never have been here. Susie says there is something about chocolate that makes it perfect for all occasions. I've never, out of all the years that we've been here at Master's Hand, I've never had someone return a box of chocolate. It fits. You don't have to get worried about getting the right size. a chocolate tip and I'm going to teach you how to make your own chocolate bowls at home. You're going to take a balloon, you're going to dip it in the chocolate three times because we're going to try to make this look like a little tulip. All right, and then I'm going to take it over here and I'm going to put it on my tray. Now once it's done here, I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it in the cooler for about five minutes right in that area. Once it's all cool, I'm going to take them out of the cooler and then I'm just gonna gently pop this balloon. Okay, now's the fun part. You get to bring all kinds of goodies here and we're just gonna fill them up. Now this right here is a pudding mixture, but you can use ice cream, you can use mousse. Oh, this is gonna be so good. Let's put a few raspberries in there because who couldn't love raspberries? Yum. And then we're gonna put some whipped cream on top. There you go, something you can do for your family at home. Back in Kansas City, Christopher Elbow may be best known for his bonbons, but one of his most recent endeavors is his bean to bar line of candy bars. To know where his cacao beans come from and who grows them, he travels extensively to the growing regions and has done lots of research on cacao in history. The journey from the discovery of cacao to present day to a chocolate bar is a long, fascinating piece of history. I think 10,000 BP is when chocolate was discovered in the Amazon basin. And typically it would have been used in the Mayan culture. They used to serve it as a drink, a very bitter drink, a very unfamiliar flavor. And then over time, the cultures have learned that the, you can ferment the bean and dry it and further refine it into what we associate uh, chocolate. And the Europeans came over and landed in Central and South America, saw the natives handling this bean um, as a very precious currency and something very valuable. So they took it back. And it wasn't until then that sugar started being added to it and, and it becoming something that we know of uh, chocolate as today. The cocoa growing region is small and cacao is not a very lucrative crop to farm. Cacao grows typically approximately 18 degrees north and south of the equator. It's in very hot tropical, um, it's usually low altitude. So it's a little, overlaps with coffee a little bit, but coffee would be typically a higher altitude. Cocoa grows on trees and is difficult to grow because the harvesting process cannot be mechanized and some trees can grow up to 30 feet high. It's a pod that, that grows off the stems and trunks of trees and inside that pod it would contain about 40 to 60 of the seeds or the beans that we call them and that's covered with a very citrusy sweet membrane that aids in the fermentation process. It takes about three to four years for a tree to bear fruit and then another three to four years for it to become fully mature to where it's actually uh, um, producing a, a lot of fruit. Christopher gets beans from about 15 different countries currently and he's traveled all through Central America and to Colombia, Brazil, Peru and Ecuador in South America. One of our goals 
um, is ultimately in an effort to make cacao more sustainable, is to uh, work with the farmers, make sure they're getting a fair price for their crop and they have somebody to sell it to. Christopher created a foundation where some proceeds from the sales of his bean to bar products will support that effort. The whole goal of visiting the farmers is twofold. Number one, to make sure that the product's gonna be good and it's gonna be something that we're gonna be able to make good chocolate out of, but also that their conditions and the farmers are engaged in um, good practices. Most cocoa farmers don't consume chocolate or know what it tastes like, so Elbow gets satisfaction when he can provide them their first taste of the end product. We took a white chocolate made with this uh, group's milk and you know, their name is on the package and, um, you know, they, kids were coming up and just grabbing handfuls of this chocolate. Uh, so to see them, you know, make the connection between, you know, what we have created and what they've provided us was a really kind of a magical moment. There are several steps the bean goes through before it's ready to turn into the chocolate Nebraskans usually eat. After being hand harvested, the pods are broken open and fermentation begins. The fermentation process is really what starts creating the chocolate flavors and precursors that we would associate with chocolate. Once the fermentation happens over about five to seven days, the beans are dried for another five to seven days. At this point, the beans are shipped to chocolate makers like Elbow, who further refine them. Our first step is to sort through those and get rid of any extraneous material, thing, you know, sticks, rocks, things that won't make good chocolate, but also broken beans, things that got damaged in transit. The smallest amount of um, negative um, beans would impact a whole entire batch. The very first step in our process and where we can start developing flavor is the roasting process. And it's somewhat similar to coffee where we're roasting to a certain profile for a certain bean. We're doing it at a much lower temperature though. Roasting typically takes about an hour and is carefully charted to ensure the beans are cooked all the way through and not burnt. The next step would be to crack the beans and we would end up with a big bucket of the shell and the cocoa bean. So we put them through what's called a winnower and that removes the shell so we're left with the very clean nib and that's what will formulate our recipe and go into the refiner. And the point of the refiner is to use heat and friction and pressure to basically liquefy the bean. The bean is 50%, roughly 55% fat, cocoa in the form of cocoa butter. So we want to break that down into a small particles where it will liquefy and that allows us to actually refine that chocolate down to a very smooth particle size that's gonna be really pleasing on the mouth. And we'll also combine the sugar in at that point as well. Refining is about a two-day process. From there, the liquid goes into a conch for three or four more days. This is where final flavor tweaks are made. And with this machine, we have the ability to further um, push the flavor. We can take the temperature up really high to where some of the kind of volatile acids will flash off. Elbow found that letting chocolate age before it is cast into a bar further brings out the flavor. Even after we make the chocolate, we typically put it into big blocks and we'll uh, store it for two to three months before we cast it into chocolate bars. Christopher hopes that by letting consumers see the process, they will have a heightened awareness about how involved it is and not take each chocolate bite for granted. Bean to Bar is a way to get customers the freshest, purest end result as possible. That's also the foundation for Cup of Co, a hot chocolate mix originally produced in Salt Lake City, but now owned and distributed in Nebraska. I am an original Barista's Daily Grind barista. Barista started in 2001 here in Kearney, Nebraska. I am now the third owner of this company, and uh, Cup of Co was also a Barista's Daily Grind company that ownership has passed on to me. So how exactly did the official sponsored cocoa for the 2002 Winter Olympic Games in Salt Lake City end up in Nebraska? Cocoa Pub's Cup of Co used to be originated in Utah. And at the time, uh, our coffee shop, Barista's Daily Grind, was franchising all over the state. And we made up 30% of Cocoa Pub's sales. 
And so when the original owners of that company decided to move on to something else, uh, they asked us if we would be interested in, in taking over the whole company, which we did back in 2007. Jasmine fell in love with Cup of Co before becoming the owner. She hasn't found any instant hot chocolate she likes better, so becoming the owner was an easy decision. When you come across something unique, something like this that uh, sticks in your memory, that sticks in your mouth, that even when you haven't had it for years, you go back to, wow, that was a good cup of cocoa. Um, how can you not be passionate about that? To Jasmine, the ingredients and recipe are what make Cup of Co stand out. Even though it is a mix with water formula, there is tons of milk in my product. We just found that using a dry milk product produced a rich, creamy cocoa, so you can't tell that my cocoa is mixed with water. And then we also use three different chocolates. One of them we import from Germany. It's a Dutch chocolate with a really high fat content. And what this means is that when you pour your water into my cocoa and you mix it, it develops this really rich, creamy, frothy head. Cup of Co is a luxury hot chocolate made with all natural ingredients. Its unique characteristics make it versatile, too. We're the only hot chocolate company in the entire country that can be served hot. The same mixture can be served blended or frozen. Uh, it can also be cooked down into a syrup or sauce. And our recipe is unique because you can do all of those things with just water. The cocoa is produced in Nebraska and hand packed in Kearney at Barista's Daily Grind. We roll the tins uh, by hand and we'll actually do that way in advance and have them ready so that when the cocoa sleeves show up, we can just drop the cocoa sleeves in, slap the lids on, and ship from our coffee shops out to uh, all of the customers that are ordering Cup of Co. Jasmine is happy that her specialty hot chocolate allows Barista's Daily Grind to go beyond being just another coffee shop. Cup of Co is a signature product. It draws people. It's so good that all of those non-coffee drinkers will say, go to that place because they have the good hot chocolate. Chocolate. Cheers. Cheers. Jasmine enjoys being from Nebraska, and she's proud that her small Nebraska companies impact her home state. I love our wide open skies and that life's a little slower here. I think that's part of the reason why we can appreciate fine things because we take the time um, to notice them. People don't realize what amazing things are coming out of this part of the country and going all over the United States. Even farther west in Sydney, 88-year-old Bertha Mueller ships her homemade chocolates around the world. Mueller, known mainly by the locals, is a former Cabela's employee who opens up her home twice a year, at Christmas and Valentine's Day, to her chocolate fans. Welcome, come in. <laughs> Glad you could come. The first years I made just a little bit for my family, and then I started giving them as gifts. And uh, the people that we gave them as gifts to very often said, I wish we could buy these. And so 12 years ago, Christmas, my husband died, and he died on December 2nd. And it just was such a blah holiday season for us. And so my daughter Pam said, Mom, do you think we should try making and selling some chocolates this year? And I said, why not? Perfect. Thank, you, sir. Thank you very much. The recipe came from Bertha's cousin, who promised to share it with her as long as she kept it in the family. The first of November, we start making the fondant and work really hard during the whole month of November because it's, it's very time consuming. So we work long, long hours and Sometimes we really burn the midnight oil. <laughs> but it's kind of fun because Pam and I work together on it, and so it gives us a lot of together time. Bertha and Pam make at least 60 different flavors, which are offered in milk, dark, or white chocolate. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I make 30 batches of fondant, and each batch makes 90 balls. Plus, I make all the fudges. The sea salt caramels have been a big seller the last few years. Mrs. Mueller went 12 years before a slight price increase, but it only covers cost of supplies. My son asked me, he said, well, Mom, do you make any money doing that? And I said, yes, we make some money. And he said, well, do you make minimum wage? And I just laughed. I said, if we paid ourselves a dollar an hour, we would go in the hole. <laughs> it's not something you do 
because you want to make money, it's something you do because you love it. Bertha says at her age, the feeling of achievement is pay enough. It's hard to find anything that you really feel like you have, have accomplished something. And making the chocolates, I feel like I've accomplished something. And also it's good because uh, people are like them and it's good to do something that people want and that they want bad enough to come to go, come out of their way to get. Mueller even mails chocolates for just the cost of postage to fans around the country and the world. We have customers who send us their Christmas list and we send like eight or 10 boxes to different locations around. And the farthest I've sent any is to Australia. And uh, mostly it's continental United States and Alaska. Only time will tell how long Bertha will keep making and selling her confections. I guess I'll do it as long as I enjoy it. And uh, when I stop enjoying it, then I won't do it anymore. And lately I said, well, maybe I'll retire when I'm 90. <laughs> but that's getting pretty close now. <laughs> My name is Christopher Elbow from Christopher Elbow Chocolates, and today I am going to talk a little bit about how to store chocolate. Chocolate, and cocoa butter especially, has a tendency to absorb odors, so um, storing chocolate right next to an onion in your kitchen is probably not a good idea if you're going to use that to, to bake a cake with. So the best thing to do is if you have any of these kind of airtight containers, these work really, really well. And get the air out and then store these in a cool, dark place. 60 degrees would be preferred. Um, you can store them in the refrigerator for longer term storage, um, but we always recommend making sure you bring it to room temperature before you open up the package. Now, if you don't have any of these little containers here, you can always use um, good old plastic wrap. Just making sure you do a few layers really, really tight. I would probably do two to three layers before, especially if we're gonna put it in the refrigerator. like that. Something about chocolate brings people together. Bertha Mueller's chocolates attract family and friends for two special chocolate holidays. Columbus author and speaker Deb Burma noticed that too. And that inspired her to write a women's Bible study around the theme. I pray this won't be the last time we hear it. May we never tire. We'd been leading a series of these events for a few years. When we started talking as a team about what is one thing that most every woman shares a love for? Chocolate. Yes, let's talk chocolate. So the exciting part for me is I thought, let's do a chocolate themed women's event and see what happens. Hot chocolate. As Deb started planning her event and looking through scripture, she had no problem finding word pictures and themes that coincided with similar chocolate connectors. What are all the things we crave in life seeking for something that's going to satisfy us? And, and I'm, taken to, I'm taken to God's Word, where He says that uh, He satisfies every need of ours through His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. I think about things that are rich and lavish and how we savor chocolate as it sits on our tongue and, and um, we long for more, right? So what's rich and lavish? God's rich grace for us that he lavished on us. Right there in the pages of scripture. I love the delicious blend of chocolate and coffee. Deb planned her chocolate retreat and its success showed her that chocolate did in fact bring women together. We brought chocolate in and we had, as I said, topped out 60 to 100 women. Suddenly 220 women walked through the door that morning and we saw that chocolate brought women together. What is it about chocolate? I think it's rich, it's lavish, it's delicious. Let's be real. And, and it's beautiful. Deb's book, Living a Chocolate Life, uses recipes and everyday experiences to help women relate to words in the Bible. An extravagant three-layer chocolate cake that I baked only to find a catastrophe on my hands as it split in two and, and cascaded down the sides of the cake plate and onto the table one big crumbling mess. And sometimes our lives feel like one big crumbling mess. 
Burma understands that the Bible and Bible studies can be intimidating, and she finds that the relatable topic of chocolate breaks down some of those walls. With the concept and even the title, Living a Chocolate Life, women were not afraid to bring a friend, a neighbor, somebody who had been maybe hesitant, unresponsive in the past, or just intimidated about Bible study to see that it can be real, a real place, an authentic place of sharing and giggling and, and, and maybe some tears growing together around chocolate, around such a fun, relatable topic. Deb loves seeing people across the country share her Bible study and recipes while enjoying girl time in the name of chocolate. You can find chocolatiers and chocolate shops all over this country and beautifully right here in Nebraska. Chocolate is so appealing that who can't talk about it? As a Christian author and speaker, Deb Burma wears her faith on her sleeve. Melissa Stevens of the Cordial Cherry in Omaha shares a love for God and credits him for being where she is today. She just didn't think it would happen by making adorable little snowmen. Over the years, I've seen how he's been able to use that for his purpose, and it's been a really neat lesson. So everything from all of the fundraisers that we've been able to be a part of, the thousands of chocolates that we've donated to help contribute to needy families and children and different organizations that are important, to just the gift giving, to touch somebody's heart and make someone smile that needed, needed that. So I no longer feel like I'm not doing something noble. I actually feel like I'm doing exactly what God designed me to do. And what she was designed to do? create chocolate-covered cherries that are not only delicious, but are almost too cute to eat. So a lot of people are surprised to find out that everything on there is completely edible. We also get a lot of people are surprised to find out that everything's done by hand. So, um, you know, we don't use any molds to create any of the pieces or designs for our cordial cherries. So everything start to finish is done by hand. Melissa learned how to make cordial cherries from her grandmother. And that was just the beginning of what would become the cordial cherry in Omaha. She had always made them for a Christmas treat for us, so it had become a holiday tradition for our family. And um, eventually I, I was curious enough, I wanted to learn how to make them myself. And she was kind of reluctant because it's quite a process. It took about a week or so of her kind of working with me, but I was able to get it down. Before any decorating can take place, the cherries must be turned into cordial cherries. We order in all of our cherries from the Washington, Oregon area. The next step is draining the cherries. We have to prepare a liquid fondant. It's kind of a, a hot liquid fondant. So once it cools, it's hardened. Once we set them down on the paper, they uh, cool down immediately and are hardened. And we have about an hour or so before we have to dip them in chocolate to create a, a casing so that that liquefaction can start to develop while they're encased in the chocolate. Melissa estimates she has come up with 200 plus cherry designs over the years. My favorite cordial cherry design is our snowman cordial cherries. And it's a really fun one. Um, just because there's so much versatility. They look so happy as you're making them. It's hard to not make them and not smile. And it's got a soft spot in my heart because it was one of my very first designs. Melissa is an interesting mix of artist and scientist. She has a bachelor's degree in biotechnology and a teaching degree with a master's in biology. She was teaching and getting her doctorate in education administration when she started making chocolates to help pay for her education. All this while raising four kids. So I'm left brain, right brain, definitely. I had a background in pottery, so that was kind of my foundation, which I use a lot of the same uh, techniques, actually, and the sculpting and such of some of the chocolates that we do. Um, but I also am very analytical, so I love, um, you know, science and research and problem solving, which has benefited me in terms of business. Even beyond the recipe, family was the key motivation to the cordial cherries roots. One of the primary motivators uh, for opening my shop was my desire to homeschool my kids. So I, I was a teacher and um, it was really tugging at my heart that I was um, teaching everybody else's kids every day and I was missing out on watching my kids learn. And family is still one of the keys to its success. 
I was literally working around the clock. I recruited everybody who I could possibly recruit. So that meant my kids were in there folding boxes. My dad was in there. I don't even think he's made a sandwich before. And he, I, he learned to dip cherries. And uh, my sister was there and her husband. And we just had everybody who was willing to help come in and sort of rescue me that first holiday season. As soon as we got through that season, we realized, okay, I, we are actually onto something. There's no way I can do this by myself. And so uh, my mom and sister at the time were willing to jump in as partners. The chocolate makers we visited do most of their business between October and February. Melissa found that to be true of her shop as well. Our most popular design, if we compared the entire year, would still be our holiday designs. And among those, it's probably a toss up between our nativity collection, which is a nine piece collection that landed on Oprah's list a few years ago, kind of put us on the map, that was exciting. And then just stereotypical Christmas designs, so our Santas, reindeers, elves, and snowmen. Besides the acclaim of making Oprah's list, Melissa's chocolates have been gifted at the Emmy Awards a few times. They've been featured in Entrepreneur.com and they've appeared on the Today Show. And although those accolades are appreciated, Stevens won't take all the credit. I just feel blessed. We have a business that we do some really unique things, and we've had some incredible opportunities uh, come our way, and I don't think that's by chance. Melissa is a woman with many passions who can't sit still. She recently obtained a patent pending on one of her inventions. I had this idea to be able to stack pastries without them crushing each other and to create really cool, huge towers of pastries and other food items. It's called Hot Stacker. Another one of Melissa's passions is mentoring, especially up and coming women entrepreneurs. One mentee is Alexandra Radigan. She is a chocolatier on staff at the Cordial Cherry who has her own brand of chocolates called the Chocolate Poet. I've just mentored her along the way um, just to kind of help her get her business up and running. And so not only does she uh, manufacture her chocolates here, but we sell her, her chocolates in the shop as well. Passionate about chocolate, others, and life, Melissa is surely living a chocolate life. One common denominator in all these stories is family. Chocolate making brings families together. Chocolate eating brings friends together like family. It's tough to work family and we've done a very good job at it. I can see the grandkids, we've got one granddaughter. If she had worked here tomorrow, she'd quit school. And uh, I think the legacy will have nothing to do with the business itself, but basically being able to run a business with all the family involved, without fights, quarrels, and we've done real well. We haven't had too many really bad spots. Well, I met him in May. He was a candy maker, and uh, we got married in October. We were married uh, 36 years before he passed away. Bye. <laughs> when we go to those uh, events, she's really good at promoting the My Chocolates. I think, you know, it's a really good uh, partnership. My wife's name is Jennifer Elbow, and she is uh, responsible for creating the logo and the branding of our company, and has played a huge part in helping us grow our brand and, and fine tune it over the years. The thing about chocolate, that is so successful at bringing people together. It is uh, considered, first of all, the number one food craving in America, and that especially by women. It's so delicious, it's so enjoyed by all, and it's such a fun way that we can gather together. I just have a team of just amazing gals, and, and they love what they do and they just bring joy here, and um, they're just really great. So I'm functional in all the areas, but my girls are great at all the areas. My mom's my best friend. My sister is amazing. I'm so grateful to both of them. My dad is a huge support. He's there anytime I need help just pitching in to make things or helping with my kids because we're so busy. It's just a wonderful uh, mother-daughter experience, and I couldn't do it without her. It's a challenge for her because she works long hours at her job and has other responsibilities, so that I appreciate her so much. Hi, 
my name is Melissa Stevens and I own the Cordial Cherry. Uh, today I'm going to show you how to make one of our favorite holiday designs, our snowman cordial cherry. Every one of our snowman heads are made completely by hand. And then we come in and just create a little carrot nose with some orange colored confectionery coating. One of my favorite tools is a paper clip. So we use this to actually make our little eyes. And to create the hat, I'm actually using just a piping cone made out of parchment paper. We just do a first layer, it's just a little dollop. The second layer, same idea, but a little smaller. And we finish that up with a candy piece on top. And then to pull it all together, we actually trim one of our cordial cherries and take the stem off. And we have to seal that top so that the syrup inside doesn't leak out. But that serves a couple purposes. Not only to seal it, but it also provides somewhere for our scarf, as well as a point of contact to glue the little head on.